Does anyone actually consider getting one of these in honor? Hello, my name is Margaret Adell, and welcome to Margaret Adell's Niche Indie Book Awards. You may have seen other book awards. They're pretty standard at this point across the bookish community for both indie and traditionally published books, but mine are a touch different. You know, other awards are like Best Romance, Best LGBT, also Romance, Best Fantasy. I don't really do those kind of things. Because I struggle when given such very large categories to pick from. Now, obviously, this was not voted on by a committee. This is just me picking out books and giving them really random categories to win and then talking about them. But in this case, a couple categories are coming back from last year. So we have some repeats and I'm really excited to talk about some more books. So without further ado, who has won an award? First, let's talk about one of our awards coming back from last year, and this is the award for the book that makes me most wish I was in a polycule. This one was a tricky one. I have read so many more polyam books. There was a lot of competition in this category this year, but the winner is Company of Fiends by Catherine Moon. This is the sequel in the Tempting Monsters trilogy, and it is a uh, polycule set in a kind of otherworldly Victorian England. Uh, basically, it is a world where there's like the secret society of monsters that you see a lot. This is a monster romance because all of our monsters are notably monstrous. And uh, this is the sequel to uh, A Lady of Rooks Grove Manor. Now, I love this one more than A Lady of Rooks Grove Manor because while that book set up the concept, this book improved on it. Book one felt little too reverse harem-y for my liking. I don't like a polycule where one person feels more important than everyone else. And to a certain extent, this book still has some of those vibes because this is meant to be a, you know, a, a female reader's fantasy, but it developed in a lot other ways to lessen the impact of that. For example, this one actually deals with a lot of polycule dynamics among the men in the group and how they interact with each other as opposed to how just they all interact with the main woman. And also, the uh, plot of this one is a lot more even than the first book. The first book, uh, someone else actually I saw described it as Chunky Jam, which, yeah, is accurate because there was very, very little going on. It was just vibes. It was just sex scenes with monsters. And then suddenly, big antagonist, a lot of things going on. Like, it was very uneven. This book is a lot more even keeled. It's a kind of a Jack the Ripper-esque situation where our theater for monsters, basically ye old porn studio, <laughs> because it is a sex theater, uh, is under attack. The women who go home at night are being attacked and killed, and our uh, protagonist, Hazel, is really worried about that, but also she's been feeling really unsatisfied in the theater lately, and she doesn't know if she wants to leave or not. She has secrets of her own that she's keeping bottled up, and of course, over the course of the book, she both realizes she's in love with people she already knew and meets other fun gentlemen to also fall in love with, and they create a polycule. And like I mentioned before, this polycule is a lot better rounded, uh, which it was strange to me that A Lady of Rooks Grove Manor had such reverse harem dynamics because I've read other books by this author written before A Lady of Rooks Grove Manor and they had excellent polycule dynamics. I've literally given this award to this author last year, but something about that first book just, mm. but this book, Company of Fiends, even it out, gave more of a plot, gave more polycule dynamics, and I'm really, really hoping that that uh, improvement includes book three. I would love to see it continue and for book three to just be absolute perfection. So fingers crossed and also congratulations Miss Moon. Up next is another repeat from last year. The book that forever altered how I view a beloved cultural figure and it's also Santa Claus. People just really keep wanting to give Santa Claus updates. <laughs> and that goes to 
Duckett and Dyer, Mystery of the Murdered Guy by G.M. Nair. This is the third book in the Duckett and Dyer Dicks for Hire series, and it reads kind of like a short story collection. A lot of the first half of the book is made up of short stories that were previously published separately, with the last one, the titular Mystery of the Murdered Guy, being the one that actually continues the plot from previous books. Normally, I would really dislike that, or at least be meh by it, because it's basically a training montage in full book form. However, I love the dynamic of this book. I love the voice of it. And most importantly, this also gives us a lot of insight into especially Stephanie's uh, like mindset throughout the course of the book. In the first couple books, you think that she is just this most lackadaisical, apathetic, like doesn't want to work at anything ever kind of person. And then as the series continues, you see that she has reasons for that. And on top of that, you see that she's actually working a lot harder than you think she is. She's actually a lot more clever than people give her credit for. She's just hiding it. And also there's been trauma and her relationship with uh, Michael, which I am assured... I am assured by the author it's going to remain platonic. He has no desire to do the whole man plus woman must be in a romantic relationship just because they're partners thing. Thank you. Uh, it continues to grow and develop and they continue to understand each other and grow into the like saving the world team that they're kind of prophesied to become. But specifically, there's one short story originally published separately that involves Santa Claus as a psychopathic killer. So, <laughs> last year, when I handed out this award for, again, a book talking about Santa Claus, it was for an erotic holiday romance that made Santa Claus sexy. So this was, you know, the pendulum swinging in the other direction. <laughs> but uh, this series has always been hyper weird. So, yeah, yeah, no, actually, if it's in that they made Santa Claus um, turn into a psychopathic killer because he was transported here from another dimension and he just hates it here. He just... <laughs> He just hates our universe. Uh, at least this version of Santa Claus. Keep in mind that in this book series, we are dealing with the multiple dimensions theory and every universe has a lot of copies of each other. So technically in this series, there are a lot of multiple like canon Santa Clauses, uh, but one of them turns into a psychopath. Uh, so great. Love it. Love this book series. Um, and I would really like to be able to give out this award to uh, for a beloved cultural icon that isn't Santa Claus. So if anyone has like a really new take on the Easter Bunny or, you know, something like that, I'd, I'd be hyped. Please, <laughs> please let me know. And congratulations to GM Nair. So this next one is one that I'm really excited to get to. And that is the award for the sluttiest werewolf. And, and the author already knows that they won it, but I'm going to say it anyway. The, <laughs> the win goes to Naraka from Infected Moonlight by Aaron Kelly. This is the third book in the Tainted Moonlight series, a urban fantasy series all about a world in which uh, werewolves just kind of jumped out of nowhere. And they're here and they're a marginalized group because nobody trusts the disease. And it's a whole thing. And I can't talk a lot about what happens in this book because it revolves a lot around Ironically, what happened in the first book, like, the second book isn't as plot relevant to this one, but uh, the character in in uh, in question, Noraka, I, I can say even less about him because while this is the first book you properly see him, he is crucial to a lot of big reveals from previous books. So, like, I can't say a lot, but I will say that he has an adorable Irish vampire boyfriend and the audiobook for this was just a treat. I don't usually listen to audiobooks. People know this. I have a very limited window for them, but Torian killed it <laughs> with these voices. <sighs> His Irish accent for Mikael was chef's kiss, and the way he vocalized Naraka was like, all of his words were very slow and and low in, in timber, and was like, <sighs> Like I could, I could feel the smirk through my headphones. Like it was great. And uh, I actually joked on Twitter when the author saw it. I'm like, oh, this is a slutty werewolf. And she actually drew art of him like in a crop top. <laughs> so uh, slutty werewolf confirmed. And I do know, I have heard from the author um, that I believe they are getting their own spinoff in the universe. I can't remember if it's a prequel of how they got together or a continuation of what happens in this book, 
but I'm hyped. I that that is actually probably going to be a book where I am going to purposely go after the audiobook instead of the written because I just need Torian just mm, for all of that his female voices might still be slightly uncanny valley he's nailed the male voices in this series and it's just great it makes cleaning my house so much better so congratulations to I guess both Aaron Kelly and Torian Brackett for a fantastic slutty werewolf up next, another new category, the disturbing monsters who shouldn't be so hot. If you've been around my channel for a hot minute, you know that I have fallen down the monster romance well, and I have no intentions of getting out anytime soon. So this was always kind of an inevitable category to happen, but there's one specific series I want to give this one to because a lot of monster romances use standard monsters and no shame obviously i love the monster romance genre i love these monsters but they tend to use pre-made monsters like gargoyles or nagas or like something similar to the beast from beauty and the beast type of monsters but this book series actually created an entire new kind and they're super weird and i love them so this award goes to the Duskwalkers from the Duskwalker series by opal rain the first book in this one is a soul to keep and in this book series these Duskwalkers are basically working a, a middle ground in the world the world is filled with demons and humans and Duskwalkers are some kind of middle ground between the two that nobody can figure out but the thing is is that they have giant skulls for heads and they have have very monstrous inclinations in this world they are born well you actually get to see some stuff later on in the series and it's terrifying uh but um they are hunger incarnate they uh eat anything and everything from a very young age and they get even hungrier when it comes to fear so in a lot of cases the uh monsters and the women they're falling in love with are walking a very big tightrope because if the the monster smells fear on the woman he could turn hungry and accidentally kill her and i love the mechanics of these monsters i love the world building of the veil that they live in i love uh the creature design in like the skull and the, it's just the covers are always so striking um the the way their eyes uh are just orbs but they change color to show emotions in a way that like their skull faces can't and of course you have fun anatomy for the steamy scenes because that's why that's why you read a monster erotica <laughs> and uh they are monsters that truly feel like monsters they don't feel like a human mind reflavored which is great i love it i also love how this series is chunky uh the first book is 500 pages the second book i believe is over 600 these are like thick books with a lot of world building a lot of reveals of the dusk walkers past and i am so hype for uh the next one coming out i want to say it's called a soul to touch but i don't remember all of the book series is a soul to blank um but i i love it so much if you like monster romance, I would highly suggest this one. However, as I usually bring up when I'm talking monster romances, this is not a beginner book. Uh, this is not like if you've never done anything with a notably non-human love interest in a book before, this one might be a little bit deeper end. But you never know. If you're the kid that cannonballs into the deep end at the first sign of the pool, then go with the guts. Uh, but <laughs> love it. They should not be as hot as they are. But well, the, the long tongue helps, let's be honest. So <laughs> congratulations to Opal Rain. Up next is The Strangest Story. I will brag about reading. This one is important to me because I like to re-up my oddball cred every now and then. I pride myself on reading stranger things that are off the beaten path. And sometimes I just like dive headfirst into the thicket to really find a weird book to make sure that I am still that oddball reader. So, uh, honorary mention for this one, uh, God Squatter by Gerard Hyde Gherkin. Uh, you know, sentient race of potatoes taking over the world. Uh, really love the odd concept. However, however, it was just beaten out by sock puppets. So, <laughs> the winner for this category is A Puppet Scorned by Jamie Court. This is a <laughs> erotic horror with sock puppets. 
I'm not joking. <laughs> this is an erotic horror taking place in an attic. No human characters. Sentient sock puppets that move around on their own and have like a, a tryst that turns horribly wrong. And there's like sock puppet body horror. Uh, I, I don't know how else to explain it. I can't explain half of what goes on in this book, to be honest. This book is only like, it's a short story, actually. It's like 30 pages. And I struggle to <laughs> discuss it in any meaningful way because it's just so odd and I love it. Um, it's also a lot more disturbing than I thought it would be because I thought the fact that it was socks with button eyes that like, oh, the, the body horror can't be that bad, right? Like, pfft. no, no, that, that ending scene, that ending scene got me like, <laughs> like on, might have been actual nausea. So, um, this is great if you also want to up your audible cred, but if you haven't done a lot with weird books, uh, yeah, not beginner friendly, <laughs> but it's great. Um, fun fact, this was actually picked up by a anthology of weird stories. And then I got a review copy of this anthology of weird stories. So who knows, maybe next year I will have another short story to add to this category. Uh, but for now, this one's weird enough for me. <laughs> Congratulations, Jamie Court. This next award is one of the highest I can bestow on an indie author, and that is the award for a miscommunication trope I didn't hate. I could go into details on why exactly it is that I dislike the miscommunication trope, but we're just going to jump into the book that I actually really liked. I actually delighted in this miscommunication, and it was well, a delight. And that is Luxuria by Colette Rhodes. This is the first book in the Shades of a Sin series. Yes, it is a monster romance. Are we surprised? In this instance, we have a young huntress who was ousted from her, like, hunter community when, um, lewd drawings she drew of the monsters they were supposed to kill came to light. Uh, now, in their world, in our world, shades look like the kind of, like, Grim Reaper looking things, and that's what she thinks she's going to be, uh, put into an arranged marriage with, and she's jazzed. Like, yeah, yeah, marry me off to the monsters. Let's go. Uh, but then she goes to the other realm where the shades primarily live in, and she discovers they are basically, like, onyx looking demons with like horns and claws and the only thing colored in the world that isn't some shade of black or gray is like their eyes and that's it so she's a little perturbed by the coloration but she's like you know what cool aesthetic vibes but the best part of this miscommunication trope love it it's fantastic is alaric our monster king is just under the assumption that the huntress that is coming to be his wife is Either A, an assassin come to kill him, or B, it's just going to be miserable. Like, it's just going to hate it. So he's like, oh, she she will hate the sight of me. This will be torture on us both. Meanwhile, Ophelia is coming into this room like, yes, realm of monsters, let's go. Love in this medieval aesthetic. Like, she's so on board and she's so into it. And Alaric has no clue. <laughs> It's so good. He he thinks that she's repulsed by him when she's like, okay, horns. Like, it's great. And the big, the big thing, the big issue is, is her scent. In our world, when a human smells sweet to the shades, it is because they are afraid. So the fact that she smells sweet to everyone, everyone's like, oh, she's terrified to be here. But... You discover that there's actually miscommunication and I won't reveal why it's different. I'll let you uncover that because it is connected to some spoilers about the world, but it actually discovers that that sweet scent is coming from Ophelia specifically because she's turned on <laughs> constantly. So like Alaric will try to get the sweet scent back because he, this strange new sour scent has suddenly popped up, not knowing that that's actually her fear. Um, and he, and so he like, you know, will like tower over her, like press her against the wall, thinking that that's making her afraid. And she's just super turned on. And it's the best, the best miscommunication trope ever. <laughs> like, 
I usually, in most cases, will just suffer through a miscommunication trope. Maybe if there's some extra angst because of it or some pining, it's fun. But this is the first one where I was just like having the time of my life with this miscommunication. And um, I think, I think I discovered another monster romance uh, on my TBR that has a vibe similar to this one. So I'm like, I'm probably going to rush to get that one. So maybe, maybe I'll have another for this category next year. But it's just, it's so good good <laughs> and the realization and and her yelling at him no I wasn't afraid like oh it's so good I love it so much I am going to continue with the series although I am bummed that the the next part of the series isn't gonna have that fun miscommunication it's actually looking to be more enemies to lovers but it's great highly recommended <laughs> Up next, our final category, and this is for cutest animal sidekick. Now, I know what you might be thinking, Margaret, are you really going to use this as another reason to pull out the Frith Chronicles? No, because I don't really consider the Frith Chronicles to be such animal sidekicky because the creatures in that world have full sentience, full human intelligence, full magical abilities, so they don't feel as much side. Kiki. <laughs> so instead, I picked uh, Nella from Roots and Steel by Casey White. Yes, um, I did not decide to get into lit RPGs. It's just some of my uh, regularly uh, reviewing authors decided to start writing lit RPGs. So now I have a couple chonkers on my list. And this one is all about this, uh, you know, our young protagonist who wants to become a better hunter within the Hunter's Guild. The problem is, is that his family is very poor, so he's never been able to enter into the tournaments that would let him level up and get into uh, more of the areas to fight more of the creatures. It is very much video game mechanics. You, you very much feel like you are watching a video game as you read this. And he discovers uh, a senior hunter, Huntress, who discovers him trespassing while trying to level up. And she takes him on as an apprentice so that he can actually move up through the ranks because he's way too strong for his level. But he now has to help her in this big tournament to become the new guild master because our current guild master is, you know, evil and, you know, evil big bad guy stuff. So... <laughs> They do stuff, stuff happens. The actual animal sidekick does not come until pretty late game. Like, like, like maybe this far in, to be honest with you. So I was wary of putting her in here. However, she's just so freaking gosh darn adorable that we're gonna have to go with it. And I know I'm not the only one that thinks this because when I posted uh, this book review uh i actually got a comment and they're like i have a question nella is best girl yes and i was like yes nella is the bestest girl uh nella is a tiny little dragon thing who at one point like he's got this big plate armor and she's like in his chest plate like curled up sleeping like oh my god <laughs> it's so cute and then another point like giant big monsters are roaring and this tiny little dragon is trying to roar back and you're like oh, Nella you're gonna get yourself killed but I appreciate the enthusiasm um however I can't tell you that much about Nella because uh spoiler <laughs> she, again it's very late game that she's introduced so I can't say a lot about her but she comes in clutch a couple times she is pertinent to some big reveals moving forward she is bestest girl um and and in general i'm excited for the continuation of the series purely for her <laughs> which you know this is a very big series to only be excited for an animal sidekick character but leave me alone i will i will do whatever it takes to see nella uh grow up and do the be the biggest bestest girl that she deserves so congratulations to casey white so that is it. That is my niche indie book words for 2022. I was happy to reuse some of the ones from the first time I ever did this. I hope to reuse words again in the future as a lot of my uh, reading tastes are going to continue into 2023. Uh, but I'm interested if you were to give out niche book awards, something off the beaten path, something hyper specific, what would it be and what book would you give it to? I'm curious. And with nothing else to say, I hope you have a wonderful day and a marvelous tomorrow.